6 this morning. If you want to get involved, uh, we'd love to hear from you. 087 9180 180. I want to tell you about the IRFU Charitable Trust and a new initiative that they have going. IRFUCharitabletrust.com forward slash friends. Since 1978, the IRFU Charitable Trust has worked tirelessly to assist severely injured rugby players in their everyday lives. And now they're asking you to become a friend. Obviously, with uh, the restrictions this year on meetups, it's been difficult for um, charities to run the traditional events that they would have used as their fundraising initiatives. Now, from the comfort of your own home, you can get involved. So without the ongoing support of our rugby friends and their generosity, the Trust says, life-changing initiatives for our seriously injured players could not be realised. Funds raised from our friends programme help with everyday needs such as wheelchairs and physical therapy, but also contribute to major initiatives including the ongoing research to spinal injury treatments, prosthesis and medications promoting nerve cell regeneration. So your friendship and generosity helps our seriously injured players live their lives to the full. And uh, I've got some more details here. So uh, check out rfucharitabletrust.com. You just pay an annual subscription and you can start your journey as a friend. At the moment, they have 100 individual friends and they're trying to get that to 1,000 by the end of the year. They have 14 rugby clubs. So if you're a member of a rugby club, you can sign up your rugby club as well. They're hoping to get to 60 rugby clubs. And they have 16 rugby schools. They're hoping to get that to 60 by the end of the year as well. So it's a big drive and it's a big important fundraiser for the Charitable Trust and hugely important that um, and we're delighted to support. And I'm also delighted to say uh, Gordon Darcy is here this morning. He's uh, currently an ambassador for them. Gordon, good morning to you. How are you? Not too bad. You caught me in the middle of the uh, the school run. Yeah. Um, but happy to come on and say hello. Yeah, and look, just very briefly, the, the Charitable Trust is something that I know that the players are always very happy to give back to because it's always something in the back of your mind. You've seen players and, and former teammates suffer fairly serious injuries along the way. It's a, it's a brutal sport when things go badly, and it's very important that we highlight the fact that the Charitable Trust exists. Yeah, listen, without a shadow of a doubt, you know, 36 players in Ireland um, that, you know, that, that need this service. Um, and you know it is the contact sport, and unfortunately, sometimes things don't don't go well. It's you know it's 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 terrible that this charity has to exist. But I, I think there's plenty of people who will who will give testament to the fact that they're delighted that it does exist. Um, but like like with anything, it, you know, we need people to we need people to support it. Um, and this is um, this is you know something born out of the pandemic, which is fantastic. Um, the you know. The uh, the friends of uh, the friends of the char of the charitable trust. It's 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 a great idea, and, and you know hopefully people can get behind it and uh, something they because uh, the people who do receive and do benefit from this are uh, are really 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 need do need it. Yeah, and 100 percent. And as I said, we're delighted to support it. Uh, Gordon, you're, the the graphic you. flashed up there. Uh, 82 Irish caps. We had Matt Williams on last night talking about maybe Ireland could consider a Matt Gitto rule. You would have qualified under the uh, criteria where you could have gone away for a season or two at the end and had some fun, maybe earned a few quid and um, still been able to play for Ireland. What's your take on, on that and just how inflexible we are at the moment? Like, I think we have to be realistic on that as well. Um, we're not... I don't think we're ever going to be able to compete with the salaries. I, th I think the way the structures in Ireland are set up, it provides a, a balance to... Um, to, to players, you will be afforded a longer career in Ireland than if you do go abroad, um, and you will be looked after better. Um, but uh, you know th there is there is a there is a quid pro quo to that. Um, success in Ireland for you know can mean European cups. It can mean you know playing for your, playing for your country uh, and going abroad. You know, in theory, it's it's one of those things. It's it's very easy to argue and say, um, oh, you know, it'll broaden the uh, player base, um, but that's not necessarily. That's you know, it's unproven. You know, these things to say just just to go and uh, and do it. Um, I think we need our best players playing here. I think when you look at all the provinces when the internationals are away, um, the big name draws. Um, when they're not there, the stadiums aren't as full. So I think if you dilute the player base even more, um, you may struggle to fill stadiums. Okay, so there's a balancing act to be struck with regards to... I think there has to, with everything, yeah. It, it, it kind of comes off the back of... So Glasgow have apparently approached Ben Healy. We don't know. They haven't come out formally and said it because that's not how these things work. And apparently there are some uh, Scottish ancestral links that would allow him to qualify for Scotland. It's a nightmare scenario where in... Uh, two years time Ben Healy is starring at 10 for Scotland and uh, beating Ireland that's kind of the, the worst case scenario and I'm, I'm sure that there's agents involved here somewhere along the way saying that this is a, a potential outcome 
of this. Uh, like, it, it is a difficult job to make sure that we keep the Ben Healy's and make sure that he gets time, game time for Munster, and at the same time. Yeah, but I don't. I don't even think necessarily this is an Irish conversation yet, and I think we have to. You know, you're talking about Dan McFarland talking about um, the young speedster up north and saying, "Listen, we need to afford this kid time to grow into the position and into, into his skill set, into his body." Exact same for Ben Healy. He has to grow. At the, everything we're seeing now is saying, "Yes, this is a guy who deserves investment," and we need Munster desperately need to keep uh, to keep him i've been incredibly critical of um the the over movement of players around uh, ireland and indigenous players need to see players need to see a pathway um into the provincial teams um and ben healy and uh, craig casey are exemplary uh, um examples of that so they have to be kept in munster um for munster to survive as as a club and should he develop into the player that we're seeing sprinklings of um, every week, then that's going to be a fantastic conversation and a fantastic selection headache for the uh, for the Irish coach. But first and foremost, we have to keep Leinster or sorry Munster Indigenous players in the country. Yeah, and I, I, I guess this is all part of the conversation that's going on about where we are at the moment with regards to the professional playing stock and essentially. In the aftermath of the um, press conference this week with David Yusufor and your column yesterday, I kind of feel like this is all part of it. It's his um, remit to make sure that the playing stock is managed properly and those contracts are managed properly. And with the pandemic, none of the contracts for the outgoing players have been signed yet or agreed yet. You made the point that it'll be a very anxious Christmas for a lot of very experienced players who have kids who are coming to the end of a deal and who are thinking should I sign a new deal in England and just lock something up because I have a mortgage and my kids are very young and I'm probably, yeah, yeah. you know, I have one contract left, maybe two. Well, there's a financial reality to life. Um, and at some point there is, I think, like probably what you're putting out there is that there's a tipping point between staying and representing, you know, being the one club man and represent and fighting for a place for the Irish jersey and then that economic reality of you of you saying, you know, I don't know what I'm going to be offered, um, but I am being offered something in, in, in France and I already I, I know of one of the players in the in the national team that um French clubs haven't changed how they're doing things. They like to have their club, they like to have their squads finished by the end of January. So if we're only starting our negotiation in January, um, you kind of wonder, you know, in the absence of certainty or clarity, you know, you can, you can if you can get it somewhere else, it's, it's, it can, it possibly could be hard to say no. Um, and I understand there's a financial, um, you know, the, that's been touted as the, you know, the financial, you know, we're still assessing um, the organization. You know, I find that one a little bit hard to uh, understand because any organization that, you know, that, geez, I've been involved in or um, would expect an organization the size of the IRFU to have done fairly robust modeling on what revenue, good, worst and best case uh, scenarios for 2021. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure where the like the ambiguity around all this. It does feel like a little bit like a negotiation tactic. Yeah, um, I couldn't help coming to the conclusion when I read your piece yesterday that you don't really think David Yusufora is doing a good job. Do you think it's time for us to look at a different system, or or should we be looking to move on from Yusufora at this point? No, I, I think, you know, it's very, you know, you have to put, uh, trying to put an awful lot into a, a few words. I think what the the problem with this is, I'm sorry, one of the problems is that there is an absence of what his remit is. And it's it's very, very loose. And, you know, what are his performance? What does success look like? That was one of the lines we used yesterday. What does success look like for David New, New Sephora? Um, because the media, the um, media, and most people that would take a keen interest in this are not that clear on it. Um, there's been a lot of movement of players in around the provinces in that, you know, New Zealand-esque uh, model. Has that been a success? Um, the review from the Rugby World Cup has not been openly uh, openly shared. It's been addressed and we have to take a word, for people, you know, if you take people's word from that, there's just, you know, I, I, I uh, you know, one of the things I'm, I'm very used to was with uh, with Joe was around clarity. 
you may not always like the clarity, but once you have it and once you're being upfront about things, it's it's easier to uh, you know to critique and to move on from it. But we, I I do feel we're being largely left in the dark with a lot of this. Yeah. So the bits of the World Cup review that came out certainly seemed to suggest that it was Schmidt's fault. There was a, a bit of blame for Enda McNulty and. Um, it was interesting to me when the photographs came out where Yusufor was actually in um, coaching gear. I didn't realise that his role was kind of on the field of play at coaching sessions as well. It, that was uh, that was a bit of a surprise to me when I saw that. So he's obviously deeply involved. I, I presume he's not actually doing coaching. He's keeping an eye on, on what the coaches are doing and trying to assess that. But th there definitely doesn't seem to be that much clarity about what the role is. Like, in, is, is it your instinct that we don't have... Um, that maybe the role is, is the right role, but we just don't know that, and that uh, an, an open and transparent discussion around that would be useful, or do you actually think that we're not doing a good job when it comes to that side of the game at the moment? Well, I do, well, it, yeah, like I don't, I don't think it's being done particularly well. Like I think, you know, if the, you know, the, the Leinster Schools game um, covers up an awful lot of the. Um, shortcomings in in some of the other provinces um you know we talk about this pathway into elite rugby and you know the the club game has to be the you know the the main underdeveloped resource in 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 the country um and where is that you know the, the whole thing has to has to knit together um so i th the role is the right role but that open conversation and that open clarity around it needs to be detailed to the people that that care and the stakeholders because you know media are a stakeholder in this fans are a stakeholder in this and the clubs and the supporters everybody are in it um and how you know what is the you know every job has a job description and every job has those key performance indicators and or what are the are the yardsticks that they're that they're judged by you know, we just, everybody would just like to understand what they are and have a better understanding of, of them. How do you repair that disconnect between someone like David Nusifora and the grassroots of Ireland? They're, they are the things that ultimately will lead to high performance and to success at high performing levels. How do you re repair that disconnect? I don't, I don't I think that, you know, this isn't a, this isn't a, um, you know, a public caning of, of David Nusifora. You know, this is where a part in the problem does does that fall under his remit or not and if it not who does it fall under? Mm. where is the development of the you know the of the uh, pathway from the um from the club game into the professional game um you know because like how many clubs 250 230 plus clubs in in the country um has every has every club got an international rep representing them like these things you know you go down to any club you go down to any um underage club you know, you know, last year or in the year in the years coming, and you will see a couple of hundred kids there every week. You know, what coaching are they getting? Is it the same quality? These are all the bits that you know we just need to you need need to understand. And that probably is moves away from the you know the David Newsom four point. But it, I, I do believe they all are integrated, and an integrated approach is probably desirable than the alternative. Yeah. Can we talk about the actual um, quality of play that you're seeing on the field at the moment? And um so well, we've obviously been talking about it a good bit on the show over the last couple of months. Like, what is the identity of Ireland under, under Andy Farrell going to be? And um, I don't really know just yet. I, I, I think he needs a little bit more time, given the lack of access that he's had and, uh, and all that. But at the same time, it'd be good to start seeing some signs. Yeah, like I think one of the things like you ha we have to fundamentally accept is there's a big transition piece going on, one in the actual squad, and then second in the style of play. So you remember we had uh, very quite spoiled with having a Devon Toner in a in a in a squad uh, for the last ten years, and regardless of how good your thrower was, you had somebody at six foot ten and you know pretty easy to lift, um, which not saying that it did mask but could potentially have masked any shortcomings in a lineout we now have two you know medium to you know two good sized second rows in ian henderson and uh, and james ryan um but we don't have that uh banker in in, in there um rory best 
you know, one of the probably the best scrummaging hookers that's ever, you know, that has played for Ireland. Um, there's been a, you know, um, Jack McGrath, James uh, Cronin in in um, in um, a killer in down in uh, down in down in Munster are not playing at the moment as well. So, are sorry, not playing well, and the killer's not playing, and Jack's, you know, fighting for his position up north. So that kind of meaty pack isn't isn't there, and th- anything you want to build off of that is going to and we've we've fallen down in the set piece massively um so any any involvement of our game plan is going to be harder to do that with a misfiring um a misfiring set piece um i think they can solve that in in the short term but i kind of feel that the game plan that we're playing at the moment there is an awful lot of theory theory based in on that that hasn't been tested in the you know, in against the Englands, against um, you know France, New Zealand, they're a real strong opposition, um, and I think we got a fairly good yardstick of where that game, the limitations of the way we were trying to play against England. Um, I think this week, if we get some growth on the game plan and see some of those um, a little bit more accuracy, and it's going to be a little bit, and I think we have to accept it's going to be a rank kicking and set piece. If we get those f- strong fundamentals and we see some of that involvement of that second line, second wave attack that they're they are starting to play, um, then that that is that's progress for me. So you can see signs of that in in, in games against lesser opposition that my cat, there are some imprints. Of what he's trying to do on the game plan, what what is it? Like what? Are... Yeah, yeah. Like they are, they, they definitely are trying to create opportunities by getting it to the width, and there's that kick and pass options on on the wide, and just getting getting their game breakers onto the onto the ball, which is around your Stockdale and uh, Bundyaki, uh, getting on them in in situations where they like, talked to me, like they've 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 said what it is, it's heads up rugby, um, but that is quite um, existential in a lot of ways because that is just creating mit- mismatches but to play heads up rugby you need a strong um, you need a strong set piece and we do not have a strong set piece at the moment so should they be able to repair that we'll get a better understanding of what they are trying trying to um, achieve and I said just to like this labor this point on the transition period we all the players talked about the over detail and the level of detail that Joe Schmidt provided for players and demanded of players, which is fine until it's taken away. And now, if you're actually putting a bit of responsibility back on players and they have to think their way out of problems and solutions, that doesn't happen overnight. That's going to take uh, that is going to take a lot of games. And I think and I hope we're feeling and seeing that pain now, um, with a view to 2021 players. Understanding, like Ross Byrne, for exa- example, will have taken that game against England, gone back, looked over every decision, and gone, "Could I have done better? Where would I? Where could I have kicked? Where could I have not have kicked? How would I? How would I manage my forwards? How could I have? How could I have kept them on the front foot? Um, tr- how could we have made England play with the ball because England didn't want the ball? All those things need to happen. That's an interesting point you make there about the Joe Schmidt coaching that it does seem that this way of, I guess, empowering the players, allowing them to make the decisions is more in line with how the coaching team at Leinster are operating. It's not a pre-programming of the players. And I guess at test level, they're just trying to get used to that. Yeah, I think so. And, like, and, and I would say the same with, uh, with the other three provinces as well. Um, Munster, it definitely, it's like the end of the Pro 14 season last year has just lifted a weight off their shoulders and they're suddenly playing... Um, you know, obviously some good Simon Delande has been very impressive for them, but they're playing a really, really nice game of rugby. Casey is playing with tempo, Healy's managing the game, uh, Scannell, all these guys are coming in and they're, and, and they're playing. We got some, you know, Coombs coming in at number eight. They're, they're playing quite a, a, an enjoyable brand of rugby. So when, they, when the Munster players do go back to that, what we do now need to see is that transition for all these players when they go back to the provinces that they continue to play we know the Leinster players are challenged continuously that the Munster Connacht and Ulster players when they go back that they absorb that type of rugby that heads up and that play what you see type of rugby and they bring it back to the national team and the national team can harness them because we know that it's almost impossible to um to do that type of coaching in a national team because you only get them for such short blocks you need them to be doing it living it every day and at least they are in the provinces, and you can see how that would make sense to bring that to national level. And you can see as well, 
in a post-COVID, post, sorry, post-vaccine, when we all get them, that actually Andy Farrell can go and spend a week with the provinces and, and like see what's happening and, and learn a bit more about them. And that's where I, I'm, I'm kind of willing to give him a little bit of time. I don't know if, uh, if, if everybody else is. Well, I, I am as well, because the, the other thing as well is, sorry, not to, not to cut you off, is the, the, the game plan has to, uh, like it has to iterate with the players that are playing it. And I think we're seeing that now when we have to see the capabilities. We're seeing Doris now coming in at eight, how well him and CJ Stander are complementing each other. Um, so how we get these people onto the ball, Stockdale has to, he's their most potent threat. The game plan has to evolve to suit the players that are taking the field. And that takes time, unfortunately. We would love to have a silver bullet, much the same way we'd love with, uh, with uh, COVID. We don't. It will be incremental improvement uh, over time. Um, I, I did want to ask one last thing, and it kind of ties before we get to um, your book, but I would, about um, Finley Bealham is getting moved from one side of the scrum to the other. I do feel like that is definitely the bit where you're looking at your national professional, whatever David News 4's gig is, and going, come on, come on, why am I still making these changes in the week of a game for somebody and seeing if he can play international test rugby out of position Come on. Yeah, like that's whatever about Andrew Porter, um, you know, that, and I will put my hand up and very, very limited on technical scrum knowledge. If that is a tight head experiment that needs to continue, I, you know, I put my hand up, but I don't see it going the other way. You know, there are plenty of players in those positions that deserve to be playing in their natural position. You know, Dennis Buckley probably isn't delighted in Connacht. You know, I think it's Eric O'Sullivan up north and uh, James Cronin in, in Munster, you know, that are experienced, established, uh, loose head props. Um, you know, that, that you know, again, is, is, is hard to, it, you know, it's hard to understand at the moment. Yeah, I, and look, you know, I mean, if you're the coach, you're doing what you can to get your to get your wins, but you hope that the pipeline is is there, and that's supposed to be somebody else's gig as well. So, um, it is Christmas yeah. time. Your your um, your second of your trilogy is out, uh, Godfather Two. It's called Blue Thunder. Is it better than the first one? Oh, of course it is. Of course it is. It picks up. It picks up uh, nicely off the off the second one. Off the second one. So um, Joe Schmidt is the Leinster coach, and he comes in, and um, uh, thankfully Paul Howard was able to. Uh, help get what was in my head down on uh, down on paper. Um, so yeah, it's uh, can Leinster um, turn it around? Um, at the start of the book, they're watching. Everybody's a Munster supporter, um, and Leinster still have hopes to win a Heineken Cup. Um, but there's a lot of road to go. A lot of a lot of a lot of fun things have to have to happen. For me, working in uh, McWonderburger to uh, hopefully winning a Heineken Cup with Joe Schmidt and, uh, and the Leinster team. I mean, uh, people forget now, that actually happened where the whole country were Munster fans. Yeah, yeah. So, like, uh, like you know, when we were writing down, writing this uh, this up and, you know, Paul, uh, you know, was a sports journalist, so he had a good handling on it. But, like, I was in Wexford and, you know, in the starting playing for Leinster. And at that time, Munster were the, you know, the dominant team in 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 Ireland and come and about to be the most dominant team in, in Europe for, you know, the next seven or eight years. Um, majority of people, they support success and they supported... Um, and they supported Munster, you know, and that's my home, you know, county. Um, but Leinster had to, we had a, we had a very clear identity as a Dublin-based team and, and credit to Mick Dawson and to everybody that's been involved with Leinster since there was a huge push to move it into a, an all province county or all province uh, club. And we did that, but we had to fight for our supporters. Um, and that comes across in the, in, in the book. Um, and it was, you know, it was fun because, you know, the Lunster thing is, uh, is, is pretty funny. Um, and then obviously this is, uh, it's a kid's book. So it's not just purely for, uh, boys. There's, um, Aoife, the, the character in, in it as well is, uh, is fighting the good fight about, um, is involved in the 20 by 20, uh, women's campaign. So, um, Aoife's character has, uh, more challenges as she's fighting for parity in, uh, in, in, in the females, in the, in the, in the women's game. And I mentioned it's a trilogy. So, um, you, you get finished the second one, you think, oh, okay, great. I can relax for a little while now. And then straight back into work for the third one. Yeah, well, like we've a good relationship with Paul, so um, I started uh, I started bothering him uh, a couple of weeks ago with some ideas. Um, but because we did most of the planning in the first book, um, 
that we can uh, we kind of have set the the rules for the universe that the the book uh, exists in. So now we just have to uh, you know map out the story and uh, and put the put the bits and pieces in it. And like Penguin are absolutely amazing, and Alan Nolan does the uh, does the illustrations, and he gets it uh, straight away. So it's just a it's it's a it, it's really good, and we really do hope that people enjoy it. Well, listen, congratulations on it. It's called Blue Thunder. It's a second book of Gordon's game. The third book, I guess, is out in time for next Christmas, but uh, gets the full thumbs up from my nine-year-old too. So, Gordon, great to have you with us. Thanks a million. <laughs> Thanks very much. It's Gordon Darcy there, who was appearing today as an ambassador for the IRFU Charitable Trust, who I would remind you, just asking you to become a friend. You can donate. IRFUCharitableTrust.com is the website, and it is uh, life-changing research for people who have suffered injuries and support for people who have suffered injuries playing rugby. 0879-180-180 is the number here. It's a minute past nine. OTBAM is live in association with Gillette. Good morning, start with Gillette, giving you the confidence to tackle the day ahead.